Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Games I've Got Rid Of and Why. Uh, this is a series of videos where I talk about games that have previously been in my collection but for one reason or another have been culled from the collection and whether that's because it's a bad game or because I've just turned on it, you know, I don't enjoy it anymore for lots of different reasons. So uh, the first game I'm going to be talking about is Escape the Curse of the Temple. Now Escape is widely regarded as one of the best real-time games. This is a game where you are cooperatively trying to escape uh, a temple uh, by rolling dice, uh, matching symbols, trying to expand out by placing tiles, shed off these gems and eventually get out the exit um, altogether. Uh, it's a really fun game, it's a frantic game and um, the reason this one left my collection is not really um, a, through a fault of the game, it's more of a self-realisation that I don't really enjoy real-time games as much as I thought I would and only, only because um, you know, when I when I have the time to play board games, I tend to want to do it in a more of a relaxed capacity, and um, I really I really found myself pulling this one off the shelf because I never really felt in the you know the high energy that you need to get the most out of this game. So, yeah, it was just a, it was just a vibe thing. I didn't really feel like I was ever really in the mood to play it because again, it is so involved, it's so shouty. You're always stood up, rolling dice constantly, and some people are going to love that, and I did enjoy it when in the right frame of mind, but generally speaking, um, I just didn't find myself um, wanting to play it. But that being said, it is a great example of a real-time game, and I would certainly play it again. You know, a quick game, and it takes 10 minutes to play because you are working against a timer. Uh, great theme, great idea, great concept, but as I said, wasn't getting played, so um, unfortunately it had to leave the collection. Uh, the second game I'm going to be talking about is Fabled Fruit. Uh, this one is a game by um, a designer that I highly respect, uh, Friedemann Fries. Um, this one probably is one of his lighter games, you know, for a more introductory gamer. Um, it's a worker placement game, but instead of having a board, you've got uh, a bunch of different cards out there. And the idea is you're trying to collect these different resources, um, or these different fruits, and then trade them in to, um, you know, to fulfill contracts basically and it's a bit of a race aspect to the game um it, it was okay i mean i think all the different cards um, were quite interesting because whenever you use them um, and start cashing them in by going to the cards you start shedding that deck meaning that the deck would deplete and a new worker placement spot would come out and um, which would kind of shake the game up a bit but ultimately i found that all the worker placement spots were not too far different from one another um, the kind of evolution of the game didn't develop quite as I would have anticipated. It was very much, um, you know, a lot of tried and tested worker placement spot kind of mechanisms, um, you know, such as having an open market or trading two fruits for another fruit or that kind of thing. Um, perfectly fine, no, but but pretty, um, you know, pretty vanilla in the in the face of it, really. But I did like the. Um, I did like it was like it was somewhat dynamic, and I think some you know intro level games are going to appreciate this one. But ultimately, um, I want a worker placement spot to be a bit more uh, worker placement game. Sorry, to be a bit more involved and a bit heavier than this one. Um, hence why uh, it didn't stay in the collection. Uh, next up, I have Fantasy Realms. Now, Fantasy Realms is a game that I do enjoy quite a bit. Um, I think so, this one's starting to gather a bit of momentum now. People are starting to um, you know, catch on about this one. This is a, quite an interesting hand management and set collection game um, where you are basically trying to forge a hand of cards to get as many points as you can because all these cards combine with each other in um, lots of weird and wonderful ways. You know, for example, um, a castle might go well with a, with a king and queen card and a certain weapon might go well with another character. Uh, really great combinations um, and yeah, lots of ways to score points. Uh, the game did have a bit of a weird pacing to it where the, the scoring phase would take a lot longer than the actual game itself. Um, but there were some really good decisions here, some quite um, some quite agonizing decisions, in fact, where you know, you'd have the perfect hand of cards, but on your turn you have to draw a new one, meaning you'd have to ditch one of them off um, into a central area, which means other people can grab them. Um, so that, you know, trying to constantly spin as many plates, plates as you can and keep those points as high as you can was quite an interesting um, idea. And to be honest, um, this one was right on the um, you know right on the line of staying in the collection or not, um, because again it's a solid design and um, to be honest I would like to play it again. Um, but I found that I, I was constantly leaning towards other filler games of this kind of ilk um, before I would come to um, Fantasy Realms. But um, you know I, I wouldn't hesitate picking this one back up because it's quite cheap and it is a very solid game with um, some good replayability there as well. And um, yeah, so a solid game and um, maybe a little bit of regret getting rid of this one. 
Uh, next up, I have Flam Rouge. Now, Flam Rouge is actually one of my favourite racing games, so I've got some really good games on this list, actually. Um, I think uh, so I should talk about the game first. So, uh, Flam Rouge is basically a game based on the um, kind of Tour de France, where you've got a pair of cyclists, you've got your like sprinter and your roller. Um, the sprinter can go kind of fast in bursts, and the roller is a bit more steady. And the idea is you're trying to play these cards from a from a from a deck, um, and basically that will dictate how far your cyclists are moving. But you can use them with each other in tandem to kind of slipstream and get uh, and kind of piggyback off each other. And the same you can do with other riders as well. So if you play the right card to move the right number of spots, you can get quite uh, a lot of. Um, boosts out of playing the right card at the right time. A bit of luck here because there is simultaneous selection and things, um, but the game works really well. It has a quite a strange um, pacing to this one as well because it's a game where you've got to pace yourself before kind of hitting that switch or flipping the trigger to um, to start racing for the finish because if you start playing all your high cards early you're going to become exhausted and get these kind of exhaustion cards into your deck and um, only be able to move a couple of spots at a time uh, you've got to time your cards carefully because you want to use your your captain going up hills and your kind of boosted by going down hills some really good ideas here and some pretty thematic ties as well to be honest um, great great solid family weight racing game absolutely fantastic uh, the reason why this one didn't stay in the collection was because uh, I got burnt out with it. I played it a lot in the kind of first year that I had this one, um, and not to not to be arrogant, I won I won this game almost every time. And um, I kind of find that when that happens, I I lose interest quickly. I like you know challenges, um, and yeah, that that was the reason really. But no fault with the game whatsoever. It was just pretty much it done its time on my shelf. It got lots of plays, um, and I know I enjoyed it for its time being with me. But I, I was ready to um, pass this one on and go on to something else. Next up, I have Francis Drake. Now, this is a gorgeous looking Euro style game as you are trying to um, travel down the um, pier in, Pir in, in Plymouth and um, picking up all these different bits and bobs that you'd need for your voyage, such as cannons, um, food supplies, that kind of thing in preparation for the second half of the game where you are going to kind of blind bid on these different spots on the board um, in order to get the best loot. But everyone's doing the same thing at the same time by blind bidding and um, and it's kind of resolved in certain order and um, you know if you play things in the wrong order then you're not going to get as much loot as you think you would and you can kind of bluff on certain spots. Some pretty good ideas here. Um, ultimately this one didn't, well it wasn't really a game that I would get to the table very often because it really does flourish at its higher player counts and generally speaking I play at the kind of two or three player mark and this one really you know really isn't that great at that player uh, player count and if I was to play uh, or if I were to have to more, more friends around and we were to play a higher player count game then I would likely not choose this one anyway um, because there was so many in front of it that I'd prefer to play but a solid design um, gorgeous production amazing great board you know great plastic pieces um, you've got your little treasure chest which hold all your um, points and things gorgeous production great looking game um, a solid game um, and another kind of reason that stopped me um, really enjoying this one as much as I probably could have um, was because the game was divided into three very distinct rounds and at the start of each of those rounds you'd pretty much reset everything so there really wasn't much forward momentum going in this game and it was very much a stop and start thing um, you know without kind of an engine or anything building up which I tend to prefer but again just just a game that wasn't going to hit the shelves very often uh, sorry hit the table very often uh, next up, I have Game of Thrones Hand of the King. Uh, this one is a nifty little filler game um, as you are trying to uh, navigate Lord Varys around this kind of grid of characters, um, trying to pick up all the different um, characters from the different houses and um, basically get a set collection bonuses by having the most of a certain um, house or suit. Um, really good, pretty abstract in, in, its, uh, in its entirety really, where you... Um, but the cool thing was that if you go kind of parallel, or sorry, um, vertical or horizontal on this grid, you'd pick up every single character of that certain house. But, you know, not only were you trying to be careful about what you get yourself, but you'd, you'd have to be very wary about which, which opportunities you would leave your opponents, because obviously wherever you left it, you would, um, you know, you could see what your opponents could potentially get off of that. I think this game did work a lot better at uh, at two player than it does at the higher player counts because there's a bit more of a deterministic feel to it. 
Um, ultimately, for me, while I, you know, while I, I enjoy the game, I, I love Game of Thrones. I love the um, artwork of this game. It looks fantastic, cartoony style, based on the kind of book characters. Um, yeah, I, I really do like quite a lot about this game. Nice little box as well, um, but a bit like um, a bit like Flam Rouge. I played this one quite a bit quite early. Um, got a little bit burnt out with it and um, ultimately I think I'd explored everything I had to explore with it and was ready to move on. So, you know, a lot of these games aren't um, aren't games that I, th I think badly of. It's just because I think a lot of games have a, have a shelf life and um, once you've hit a certain amount of plays um, with so many games out there, I'm just ready to move on to the next thing. And, um, and Hand of the King was an example of that, but a solid, uh, a solid filler game nonetheless. Uh, next up, I have uh, a game that I actually really love. This one is Gentes. Um, Gentes um, still holds my shield of quality. I highly uh, regard this game. I think it's fantastic. Um, it's a pretty standard Euro, but with some pretty nifty um, ideas going on in there. Um, I suppose it works a bit like worker placement game, where you go to these certain spots to either you know collect different um, collect different buildings and um, all the kind of standard Euro tropes. But the thing I liked about this game was that when you would take a certain action, you would actually take the piece uh, representing the action off the board and put it onto your own player board. Um, but every single action would come with a, uh, a kind of a time penalty associated with it. And you'd fill up your board with these different kind of time tokens. And every round you would be capped at a certain amount of time tokens. So if you go to certain spots earlier, you, the action would cost less time than if, the, if you were to go there after another player. That was a really unique idea. I absolutely love the way it was used. And, um, you know, a really solid game around that as well. But that core mechanism itself, that, that core mechanism is, is what, what I really loved about Gentas. Um, the reason this one didn't stay in my collection was because I had the um, I had the very lavish deluxe edition, which naturally is worth, you know, a pretty penny. Um, and it wasn't getting played now. I was always leaning towards um, other games before this one. And I thought with, you know, while it's sat there, still worth a bit of money, I thought I may as well, you know, sell it on and um, go on to something else. But I wouldn't be surprised whatsoever if um, if one day I'll go back and pick up maybe a non-deluxe version of this game because I would like to have that, have that game on my shelf simply because of that time mechanism. I think it's fantastically well used. Um, but yeah, no, no fault with the game whatsoever and more of me being a bit greedy and wanting to get the cash for it. Uh, so next up, I have... Uh, Go Town. Now, Go Town is um, a very small filler game um, by Helvetique, who um, I suppose are more famously known for making Bandido, uh, I think more recently Bandida, and um, Kariba as well. A very small box games, probably in a box that size. Um, this one was um, one of the worst games I've ever played. Um, you know, I probably don't need to go into any much more detail, but it's a kind of a, a horrible take that game as you're playing cards down, trying to build these skyscrapers constantly smashing other players, um, you know, buildings down, uh, just pr really standard dated mechanisms that um, just don't hold up at all. Um, check out my review if you want to see it, but it's horrible. Uh, and uh, next up, I have um, probably a controversial one. This is Gugong by uh, Andreas Stedding. Andreas Stedding, one of my favorite designers, uh, you know, love a lot of his games. Um, Gugong was a game I probably had the biggest kind of roller coaster journey with because when I initially played it I was in love with this game it, when I made my top 10 list um, you know all-time board games at the time this one came very highly because I was really enamored by the kind of mini game aspect to it um, it was a worker placement game but you used cards and you'd kind of replace cards with other cards in your hand um, some pretty nice ideas gorgeous production um, and ultimately the more I played this one um, I started to notice that there wasn't really much depth in terms of the way all the different mini games meshed together. It was more of uh, a broad spectrum of different things you could do rather than the deep kind of connected synergies between those different regions. Um, maybe you know, maybe not a popular opinion because I know this is a very popular game and it's certainly a game that I appreciate and I don't dislike, but um, it's definitely a game I soured on and. Um, Again, I, I maybe burnt out a bit on this one. Uh, I played it quite a bit. And ultimately, there wasn't really anything else to do in this game once you've played it a few times. Uh, but some good ideas. Again, gorgeous production, great designer. Um, but ultimately, for me, not one of the designer's best. Um, and the final game I'm going to talk about this episode is HMS Dolores, which is a really small filler game designed by Eric Lang, I believe it or not, by um, you know known for his 
Blood Rage and Rising Sun. Uh, this one is um, a simple game, a set collection game based on the uh, prisoner dilemma um, mechanism where you are basically lay a couple of cards out, you're choosing to kind of uh, agree to share with your opponents and you know take half each or choose to steal them all, that kind of thing, you know, used a lot of times in board games. Uh, this one did have a quite nifty idea where you'd only score for your um, biggest set of items and your smaller set of items and everything in between would kind of not be scored. So you'd have to kind of carefully tinker your cards where, where if you had everything level, then you'd score for everything. So that was quite cool, but ultimately I think it was a bit too random, a bit too lucky because I think once you once you start playing games like this, you can just end up playing anything and it might work out for you and it might not. And um, you know, Dolores was an example of that. Um, not a bad game, and I think a lot of people will, will like it. Very quick, um, you know, nice artwork, you know, this kind of pirate theme. Um, but so many more fillers out there that are a lot better than this one. Um, so that concludes uh, this episode of uh, 10 games I've got rid of. Um, hopefully uh, I've given some justification why they're no longer in the collection. Uh, if you have enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe to my channel and check out my other videos too. Um, I'll, also leave, leave, uh, I'll also leave the link for my Patreon uh, account below. Uh, for everyone else, I'll see you next time on Chairman of the Board.